Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here. And today I thought I would chat with you guys a little bit about whey protein, uh, post-workout recovery and all of this stuff because this has been one of the biggest marketing ploys by the supplement industry uh, in my lifetime. And when you look at it objectively, it's just not something even supported by the scientific literature. Now, some people are gonna say, well, I feel like I need my post-workout shake uh, just for an insurance policy, and, and that's fine. I don't have a problem even with people saying, hey, they want to consume a little more protein as an insurance policy. I get that. That's fine. Uh, I don't see any problem whatsoever with people consuming a little more protein than we know the data suggests that they need for maximum muscle growth, uh, particularly if it's within your budget and it's not costing you anything. But the problem is that people think that they need oftentimes this post-workout recovery shake when you actually look at the research and it's not the case. It's not even useful outside of the fact that it's consumed at some point after you train and it has, uh, you know, protein and calories and all that in it. And, and I do mean that literally. There's no benefit to the timing or the fast absorption of it. Um, and there's even some experts who who've presented some interesting data about the fact that a bunch of post-workout sugar can actually have some negative effects in the long term. And, but that's a whole nother topic. Um, so if you're going to have an insurance policy for something, your insurance policy should have some chance of being useful. In other words, if you live up in the desert mountains, uh, spending a lot of money on flood insurance probably isn't useful. You know, you might want to have some avalanche insurance, but you don't need flood insurance, you know, if in an area that has never had a flood. And it's, it's the same sort of concept here. So what do I mean? People say, well, wasn't this study, didn't they find that post-workout uh, protein and carbs and everything enhanced recovery of muscle growth? Yeah, and people who were fasted. But how many of you people train and come in and do a high volume weight training session completely fasted, right? Very, very few people. Now, I, I granted, I understand intermittent fasting has come into vogue in the last you know 10 years again, off and on, and I get that. But for the overwhelming majority of you, if you are not training fasted and i mean an overnight fast and then coming in and doing like a two-hour weight training session where you're squatting and deadlifting and all that stuff uh, an immediate post-workout shake doesn't seem to improve muscle growth right it doesn't matter in fact if we want to talk about an insurance policy what you consume before you train actually seems to be more important for muscle protein synthesis than what you consume immediately after and that makes sense. It does make sense, right? When you think about it, if we're talking about getting those nutrients to you quickly, uh, you don't get the nutrients that quickly post-workout. Like even that faster absorbing shake, you have reduced blood flow to your GI tract after you train. So actually having something in your system ahead of time that's already hitting the bloodstream uh, will go a lot further than trying to slam something fast absorbing after. I mean, technically you're getting a stronger effect from that and it might even in some cases help you with your training fuel, although that's arguable. Um, and what we actually find the reality is, is that for people who only train once a day, including even elite athletes who only train once a day, their immediate post-workout nutrition doesn't even affect uh, muscle protein synthesis. It doesn't affect glycogen uh, restoration, anything. It is just simply not that big of a factor. What you consume first seems to matter more. Again, if you're fasted, it seems to be some benefits. And all the studies that showed a benefit had people come in and do high volume workout sessions after an overnight fast. So these were people who hadn't consumed any calories of any type after something like eight o'clock at night and they came into the lab and trained fasted. They showed a benefit. They showed a benefit. But when people ate breakfast first, they didn't. And people say, well, why would they do that? That's not realistic because that's the only way they had controls unless they controlled your pre-workout meal too. And the supplement industry ran with those early studies and they used it to market post-workout recovery shakes. Well, the, the reality is, is that you find that um, there's a whole host of factors involving glycogen supercompensation and everything else, um, including the, the normalcy of your diet. Um, there, there's so many other factors involved that, that post-workout is, just isn't that critical. And the most ironic part is that when it's been studied, Here's what they found. Let's say we do find the people who do benefit from it. The post-workout recovery shakes aren't even the most effective thing they've found. I think people will be shocked when studies have actually looked for different combinations of food to find which foods actually produced 
the highest level of muscle protein synthesis and the most rapid muscle rehydration and glycogen compensation. Even for the people who were fasted, you guys know what it was? It turned out to be chocolate milk. Like store-bought chocolate milk actually was superior and when it's been tested in these parameters, even beat the whey and dextrose and branched chain amino acid loaded recovery shakes. So plain old chocolate milk is actually found to be the most anabolic out of anything that they've come up with that has actually been tested in studies post-workout. And that's actually cheaper and tastes better than these shakes. But, but the reality is, here's what people need to remember. The benefits to this for people who only train once a day and who don't train fasted seem to be non-existent. They're not measurable. We don't see any, any improvement at all when it's studied under laboratory conditions. Because let's be honest here, most of you out there just aren't training hard enough and with enough daily and weekly workload for this to really matter. You're just not. I'm sorry, that's reality. And that's not a knock at people because most of you aren't professional athletes. Most people out there who are training, this is a hobby for you. This is a recreation for you. The overwhelming majority of you are probably only lifting weights for an hour, an hour and a half a day, one time. And most people aren't coming in and doing multiple grueling training sessions a day. And so here's what's also been noted uh, looking at the research as far as uh, glycogen replenishment. When it comes to muscle growth and adaptation to training, people who only train once a day, it doesn't seem to matter how quickly you replenish it. In other words, uh, what's been noted, like for people who come in and they do all of their training in one big block, right? They come in, they train maybe hour, hour and a half, maybe do a little bit of light cardio later. And, and that's all they do in a day. And they're waiting another 24 hours before they have another high volume, high intensity training session. Um, that if those people wait even up to four hours to consume their post-workout meal, they get the exact same amount of muscle growth, the same performance changes, the same adaptations, the same recovery. As far as, especially on the glycogen end, that glycogen replenishment doesn't seem to matter as long as it happens at least at some point in the next eight hours or so after you train. The only people who seem to matter who really need rapid uh, glycogen replenishment are the people who are training twice a day. So if you have people who come in and they're doing, um, you know, an hour and a half of, of weight training, and I don't just mean an arm workout, I mean serious training. Like we're talking serious athletes at this point, right? Maybe a NFL player or a triathlete or someone. Uh, we're talking high level athletes. People who expend a lot of glycogen, they have a pretty high workload in the weight room, and then who come in later the day, a number of hours later, and they come in and do a bunch of high intensity conditioning work. Those people, if they don't replenish glycogen between, they see a performance loss. They, they don't get all the benefits of all the training they're doing and they can run into more recovery issues. But again, how many of you guys out there are coming in and doing you know 10 sets of squats followed by 10 sets of push presses and then four or five hours later, you're coming back and dragging a sled and doing farmer's walks and barbell complexes for, for 45 minutes. in a separate workout and then doing something just as hard the next day, right? Most people are not doing that. The people who are, their glycogen replenishment between those workouts matters a lot. But the majority of people, even people who train in the morning, are usually eating lunch. And they're usually eating a pretty big chunk of calories. And if they don't eat a big chunk of calories at lunch, they're eating a really big dinner. So they're getting protein uh, through multiple feedings through the day. They're getting glycogen replenishment, everything else before bedtime. And so by the time they get to bed, they have uh, all this, this food available, these calories available, their glycogen stores are getting pretty well replenished. So they're pretty well replenished by the time they go to bed. And when they go to bed that night, um, they go ahead and they're recovering and they're growing and adapting and their muscle tissue is growing and remodeling based upon the training they did while they're sleeping that night. And they do just fine. Like when we look at the, the data on that, most people who again only train once a day, that actual, as long as they even eat a nice big dinner, they'll get full adaptation, recovery, uh, everything else, and it won't negatively affect their performance, right? So the, the take home here is that you don't wanna go more than about six to eight hours without eating a really big high calorie meal after, after you train, right? That seems to be what, what really matters, particularly people who ate breakfast. Now, the only time this is really gonna be an issue 
ultimately is people who come in and train fasted and then wait several hours more before they eat their nice big heavy meal of the day. Those people are the only people who are going to have problems. But we don't need a post-workout recovery shake to solve that. We just need people to eat a halfway normal uh, manner and make sure they get enough food in. Uh, in other words, if you're eating nice, three nice, big, decently spaced out meals every day, right? you're not practicing any extreme fasting, you only really train hard once a day. Like Again, if you have a second workout at something really light and moderate, like some lower intensity cardio, if you fall into that category, you actually will get no benefits, no measurable benefits, not even a 1% improvement from worrying about your immediate post-workout nutrition. It doesn't even matter. You would be better spent just making sure you're getting a little higher quality food, a little more rest, and maybe even that you're, you're training a little bit harder. That would actually do a thousand times more for you than that post-workout recovery drink would. So it's basically a solution to a problem that doesn't exist and it's focusing on things that don't matter and oftentimes at the expense of focusing on the things that would actually help you. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.